All right. So we're here in front of the Minnesota Monument. And um, uh, in front of me, we're looking at the field where the Confederate Army was moving in on July 2nd. And uh, Major General Winfield Scott Hancock was in charge of this sector, the Union sector of the battlefield. And out in front, uh, he sees the Confederates moving in, he sees a gap in the line, and he goes to the nearest regiment, realizing that if he can get this regiment to fill that gap for just a few minutes, the reinforcements, the Union reinforcements down the road will have enough time to get here and plug that gap and stop a breakthrough from the Confederates. One of the soldiers that are with this regiment, who happened to be the first Minnesota, is pictured here. And this is Matthew Marvin. He's born in New York. He moves to Minnesota before the war. And uh, when the war begins, he enlists in the first Minnesota. And he proves to be a great soldier. He's wounded a couple times early in the war, including Bull Run. So by the time he and his comrades get to this battlefield, he's battle-hardened, he's a seasoned veteran, and he's one of the small number of survivors. The regiment left Minnesota with a thousand men, and by the time of this battle, they're down to 262. So Matthew is in the ranks that day when Hancock orders them in action. They're all laying on the ground uh, in the din of battle and the noise of the day combined with the heat. I suspect that Matthew had very little knowledge of what was going on. Events were moving so quickly. The desire to plug that gap right in front of them must have been first and foremost on their mind. And the idea of getting up from the ground with all the shells whizzing overhead and the bullets whizzing and having to run across the field in front of me towards these Confederate soldiers, uh, what it took to do that, what it took to stand up uh, was, uh, it's hard for us standing here today in this peaceful setting to imagine it, but Matthew Marvin was one of the men who did it. So he makes the charge and he doesn't really get all that far before he feels a sting in his foot. And he looks down and he sees that the heel of his brogan, his shoe, is missing and he sees the blood beginning to ooze out. It doesn't stop him. He continues to try to run, but the combination of the heat and the sweat and the pain that's setting into his foot from the bleeding takes a toll and he finally drops down to the ground. The battle rages. He does his part. He gets as quickly as he could. He gets as fast and uh, as furiously as he, as he can get there, but he can go no further. The rest of the men in his regiment go in. They do the fighting. He finally withdraws as they're all withdrawing and he makes it out and he survives his wound. He winds up being hospitalized, but he survives his wound. He goes back into the army, rejoins the regiment, and fights the rest of the war. So in some ways, his story is a story of courage because he stood up when we were in a precarious moment. If this position was lost, if the first Minnesota didn't go in, and save the day in this sector of the battlefield if Matthew Marvin wasn't one of those 262 men who made that charge and participated, we might not be standing here in the same way because of them. So that's Matthew's story. And um, it's just one of the 262. And then of course, the tens of thousands of those who were wounded that day, those three days here in Gettysburg. Those of you who are students of the Battle of Gettysburg probably recognize the position behind me. This is a little round top on the afternoon of July 2nd. You know the story of Major General Governor Warren, who is up here. Uh, there's a statue memorializing him today. Uh, he spotted, so the story goes, he spotted Confederates down in the valley where we're standing right now. 
there's also a version of the story about his interactions with the Union Signal Corps that was also up there prior to his arrival. Uh, and many of you know what happened next. You have the spotting of the Confederates and then Warren goes and grabs the first troops that he can find and orders them to take up a position along the crest of Little Round Top. Uh, historians don't quite talk as much about all of the individuals who lined up that afternoon, that brutally hot afternoon. Uh, and uh, one of the individuals who lined up uh, was a member of the 44th New York Infantry. I've got his photograph right here. Uh, this is Helam Spaulding Thompson. Uh, Thompson has an interesting history. He's a school teacher up in New York, and uh, when Lincoln is campaigning, Thompson forms a local chapter of the Wide Awakes, who uh, are big supporters organizing for the Lincoln election. So he has a unique connection to Lincoln from the earliest days of the Lincoln campaign. And so uh, when the war begins, uh, after the, uh, the death of Elmer Ellsworth in Alexandria, as he is famously or infamously hauling down a Confederate flag, uh, the state of New York rallies and they form or they desire to form a regiment of two individuals from every major town. Uh, they call it the People's Ellsworth Regiment of rallying around the martyr Ellsworth doesn't quite work out that way. It's hard to get these men from two locations, uh, but they wind up easily getting enough men to form a regiment, and Thompson is one of those men. So uh, he's in it from the beginning. He is, he's a tall guy. He's over six feet. Um, and as a school teacher, he has that ability to communicate with individuals. Uh, he is also, as many of his friends said about him, a natural born leader. And so here we have Thompson, uh, who was a non-commissioned officer in a company in the 44th. We'll flash forward from those early days in 1861 to July 2nd, 1863. Now he is with all of his comrades lining up here they don't really have time to think. This is not a moment for thinking, it's a moment for reacting uh, because you've got Confederates moving all across the land here to my left, moving up towards Little Round Top. The bullets begin flying, the violence begins, the brutality of combat unfolds, and somewhere in all of that, Thompson is shot. Uh, it's a very serious wound, uh, the bullet hits him basically in the face and moves through his nose and part of his mouth. Uh, and he is, he's left for dead. He's laying, uh, laying right up there on Little Round Top. Some hours go by. Uh, it's now nighttime. Um, the battle has quieted down. The Union is in control of this area. Uh, and as folks are moving through to uh, get the bodies off of Little Round Top and to find any remaining wounded, someone notices that Thompson is still breathing and is still alive and they get him to a hospital and thus begins his recuperation, which winds up taking mostly place in York, Pennsylvania, which is a few dozen miles from here. And um, uh, he eventually makes as much of a re recuperation as someone can, but he's not finished with the war. And that's one of the things about Thompson that really touches me um, is despite his injury and despite the sacrifice that he made, he gets back into the war and he gets back into the war with uh, a New York regiment, the 146th. Uh, and for a while he serves as a nurse um, which I think is something that he learned while he was being a patient. So there's the story of an individual. He winds up surviving the war, living a long life uh, and dying in Nebraska after 1900. 
So he lives a long life and continues that pattern of leadership and inspiration that dates all the way back to his forming of the Lincoln Wide Awakes and to his courage on the Little Round Top. All right, hey, um, we are here in front of the monument to the 124th New York Infantry. Uh, they are known as the Orange Blossoms, a nickname they received about, gosh, about a month before at the Battle of Chancellorsville. This monument is sitting at the, at the edge here of Houck's Ridge, where on July 2nd, Confederate forces were moving through the fields in front of me. A particular field is known as the Triangular Field for its obvious shape. And so, though this feels very peaceful, uh, on July 2nd in the afternoon, this was a maelstrom of heavy activity and heavy combat. So uh, if you're not familiar with this area, you will also know the area right over here next to me, which is Devil's Den, uh, prominent because of the large boulders that are strewn all about here. So uh, the soldier we're talking about is one of the men, one of the officers, who charged through the triangular field, a Confederate soldier from Georgia, who with his men charged through this field uh, in the heat of battle to take on the Union forces along Houck's Ridge. Uh, his name is Pinckney Gilliard Hatchet, and here is his photograph. Uh, he was known as Pink to his comrades and his friends and family, and so Pink led his company on the charge up against the 124th and other forces in the area. You can imagine the gunfire moving towards them. You can imagine artillery uh, in support, Union artillery um, hitting these Georgians and other Confederates as they move through the field. Hatchet, Pink, as he's known to his friends, uh, he is out in front uh, of all this and in fact, he advances so far ahead uh, that he doesn't realize that the battle is sort of turning a little bit against them. And by the time he stops and turns around, he realizes that he's cut off from his fellow Georgians. He and a small group of his comrades are up here in Devil's Den and they are trapped. There's practically no way out. In the moment that he's realizing that he's in trouble, a bullet hits him in the ankle. And so now he's wounded uh, in the leg, hard for him to move. The pain hasn't actually set in yet. There's more adrenaline than pain at this moment. Uh, so Pink manages to get a hold of himself, uh, manages to evaluate the situation and sees an opportunity to escape. So somehow, a combination of crawling and moving as quickly, hobbling as quickly as he possibly can, gets out of Devil's Den and gets back to the safety of his fellow Georgians that are out in the fields in front of me. So he manages to get uh, treatment, he makes a full recovery, goes on to fight the rest of the war, and lives a long time to tell his story. He dies in 1931, uh, so we're talking, he lives another 70 uh, years uh, after the war. He's a young man when he goes in, so lives a long, long time and tells his story over and over again, which is how I'm able to share it with you today. So there's the story of Pink Hatchet of the 20th Georgia Infantry.